Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is uh, Karen Kay, Recovered Compulsive Eater from Syracuse, New York, and my credit stone, stone transfer. Welcome to the Scottsdale Big Book Study. We will hear the study of the Big Book of AA. If you have any questions during the meeting, please contact either the host or the co-host by private message, which will be available in about two minutes. Please note that Harlan Harlan J. Harlan G. as our speaker will be recorded for the duration of the study. However, questions and answers which follows will not be recorded. We'll post a link to the previous week's recordings in the chat function. We ask if you can please make sure you're on to keep your microphone on you at all times during today's study. And so please turn off your video if you're exercising, eating, or if you need to step away from this for this from the screen for any excuse me for any reason um i will also i know somebody has the uh, the the info on the seventh tradition that we put in the chat chat function i will now turn the meeting over to harlan g and welcome once again harlan and we're going to be starting out fresh with the beginning of the book book thank you harlan thanks karen thank you for your service and thank you to all of you who do service to make this meeting possible, thank you very, very much. Um, I hope that it is as absolutely stunning wherever you are as it is here in Arizona. It's about 67 degrees right now. There isn't a cloud in the sky. And by looking out the window you, here, you would never know that it's winter time. I was watching the football game between Michigan and Ohio State for a little bit. It's the big game uh, in college rivalry if you're from my part of the country in Chicago and it's snowing and the players and the fans are all in heavy winter coats and hats and gloves and everything you could possibly imagine. And although I love Chicago very, very much, I certainly don't miss that at all. I don't miss that at all. Um, but the bottom line is it's wonderful to be here. We are going to start at the very, very beginning today because we finished the first 164th page last weekend, last Saturday. It's November the 27th. And I've got Bill Wilson right behind me. He's at Wits End, which is a little kind of a shack that is on Stepping Stones property. It's called Wits End. And that's where Bill wrote a lot of the 12 and 12 and wrote a lot of the articles that appeared over the years in the Grapevine Magazine, which is the magazine of recovery for AAs. And uh, he didn't have that home or Wits End during the writing of the big book. Most of the big book was written on Walnut Street in Newark, New Jersey. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. And some of it was written at his house at 182 Clinton Street in Brooklyn, New York. But the book project, the book that we have today called Alcoholics Anonymous came as the result of necessity. When they first started in 1935, Bill had more sobriety than anybody, which is at that time when Dr. Bob got sober, Bill had about seven months of sobriety. Bill got sober on December the 14th, 1934. Dr. Bob got sober June the 10th, 1935. So six months plus a couple of weeks is what he had sober, and he had more sobriety than anybody that were in the known world. And during 1935, 1936, what would happen is they were not AA. There was no such thing as Alcoholics Anonymous. What there was was they were the drunk squad of the Oxford group. And the Oxford groupers were people that were practicing first century Christianity to the best of their ability. And this is what the alcoholics would do is go to the Oxford group meetings. They were in Akron and they were in New York. And there was the Akron groups and there was the uh, New York groups. And Bill would travel and Dr. Bob would sometimes travel between the two groups. 
uh, as some other would too, but mostly it was Bill and Bob that did. Bob really wasn't recognized as the co-founder of AA until about 1938. For the first three years, <clears throat> Bob was just thought of as one of the first or the first sort of follower of Bill Wilson who happened to live in Akron. It wasn't until about 1938 that Dr. Bob began to be recognized as a co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, which uh, he is today. He's recognized as the co-founder of AA. And long about 1937, what was 35, 36, 37, what was happening is this guy, Bill or some guy, maybe Fitz Mayo, maybe Jimmy Burwell, Dr. Bob, whoever, they would, this, this person would have some really enthusiastic sobriety. So everybody would follow that person. And sometimes that person would get drunk or sometimes what would happen is somebody else came along that sort of got the attention of the crowd, as they say, and then they would follow that guy for a while, and then they would follow this guy for a while. But what happened is, is that the um, message was getting very garbled. It was passed by word of mouth. And what would happen is just like when you're kids and you play telephone, things were getting garbled as the messages were going through the fellowship, things were getting changed and switched around. And so by around 1937, they had decided when Bill was in Akron, he was visiting Akron and they had decided that they were gonna pitch to the fellowship there that they wanted to do three things and they felt in doing these three things that they would help the fellowship. They also kind of thought that this would be a good way to convey the message. And Bill Wilson, although I don't think Dr. Bob thought this way, Bill Wilson was pretty sure that this might set him on his feet financially. And these are the three things that they wanted to do. The first thing that they wanted to do was they wanted to write a book and they felt in writing a book that it would codify the information that was there. It would, it would codify the information and it would put it down so that it couldn't constantly be changed and altered. The second thing that they wanted to do was they wanted to start a chain of hospitals through the country. In 1937, which was during the depression, something was happening in our country that had never really happened before. You started getting a lot of these chain stores, Walgreens and different ones were starting stores all over the place, Sears, Roebuck, uh, uh, Walgreens, Walgreens was from Chicago and Sears was from Chicago too. Walgreens was a pharmacist. He was a Walgreen, not Walgreens, but Walgreen, the man was a pharmacist in Chicago. I don't know how many of you knew that, but he was from my hometown as was uh, Sears. Sears Roebuck started in Chicago, Illinois as well. And anyway, so these chain stores, these chain operations were starting to flourish. And so they got the idea that if they could start a chain of hospitals, that they could get these drunks in the hospitals and sober them up. See, at that time, even though there were guys like Bill Dotson and Dr. Bob and this one and that one, there were people that were admitted to the town's hospital. They were admitted to Bellevue. They were admitted to the hospital in Akron the doctors generally had to lie about their condition to get them in the hospital. They'd have to write down things. Maybe the guy had it, maybe he didn't, but they would put down things like gastritis. I have gastritis. They would put down like gastritis and they would put down ulcer and they would put down all kinds of conditions that the guy needed to have on his medical record 
so that they could get them admitted. Hospitals didn't want to admit people just for alcoholism. They saw no point. There was no cure. And they also, a lot of these guys didn't pay their bills. So they were not real anxious to admit an alcoholic to the hospital. But what started happening is these chains were coming up and they, Bill and Bob, not so much Bob, but Bill, not so much Bob. Bob wasn't a big supporter of this. Bob was a very modest person. Bill wanted them to start a chain of hospitals. He also wanted to start a chain of missionaries. Now, Dr. Bob, he was going to be the head of this hospital project, even though he wasn't real enthusiastic about it. But since he was a doctor, they had no one else to really turn to, and he was going to be in charge of that. Now, the missionaries, these were guys that were going to go, that were going to go all over the country, and they were going to proselytize AA. And the head missionary was going to be Bill Wilson. And Bill was going to head up this project of establishing these missionaries that would go all through the country, educating people as to what AA was and how it could help them. And the third thing, as I mentioned before, or the first thing, as I mentioned before, was this book, which didn't have a name at that time of Alcoholics Anonymous, but they wanted to write a book. They approached Rockefeller for funding, and that's a whole other story. And they had a big dinner, and they hooked up. Bill's brother-in-law was uh, Dr. Uh, Leonard Strong, and he uh, had a friend of his uh, who had an uncle. That's how loose the connection was. He had a schoolmate of his, a girl. And she had an uncle named Willard Richardson. And Willard Richardson was a member of Rockefeller's inner circle. And Leonard Strong makes a connection with this guy and they had a dinner and blah, blah, blah. And uh, they wanted money from the Rockefellers. It was a lot of, Rockefeller was a big philanthropist and there were a lot of people who would come to him for money. And Rockefeller, he himself was very anti-drinking. He was very, very against any type of consumption of alcohol. As a matter of fact, some of his inner circle asked him to please shut up about that because it was hurting his public image because a lot of the people liked drinking and a lot of the people didn't like the fact that he was a person who supported temperance. Temperance is the... Uh, a version of drinking, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, uh, Carrie Nation was the woman's name, and they started the saying, lips that touch liquor will never touch mine, and that was a long time ago. That started in Evanston, Illinois, and Evanston, Illinois, up until the time I graduated high school in the 1970s, was a dry suburb of Chicago. You could not sell liquor in Evanston, Illinois, up until the time of the mid-70s. The Hilton wanted to uh, build a hotel there in Evanston, and they said, we will build this hotel, but we will only build it if you allow us to have a bar and serve liquor at our restaurant. And that's when Evanston started using liquor licenses to grant permission to certain uh, establishments to sell liquor. But Evanston was dry right from the Civil War right up to the mid 1970s that that whole WCTU was very strong, very strong there. Well, anyway, Rockefeller believed that money would ruin this thing. And they were so disappointed because they had hoped that Rockefeller would help them with some money, which he later did. He did give them some money. And what happened then was he got paid back. The Alcoholics Anonymous was the only company, the company, the only organization that ever paid Rockefeller back in full for the money that he gave them. But that wasn't until later. So this is what they had decided to do. They had decided to move forward on the book project in 1937. The Akron groups were not supportive of it at all. And they wanted nothing to do with it. They felt like this was a money-making kind of thing and they were not really behind this at all. The New York groups were very much behind it. 
the New York groups wanted more of a psychological book, sort of a psychology 101 of uh, sort of a primer on alcoholism, psychology 101, and maybe a little, little, little spirituality in there. Just not a lot, though. And the Akron people, if you're going to write the book, they wanted a very religious kind of God, 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 and more God. Uh, the old Saturday Night uh, Live skit, More Cowbell, More Cowbell. If you remember back many years ago, they had the More Cowbell, More Cowbell. Well, that's what they were in for. They wanted more God in the book. And the fight was on. And Bill Wilson, he started writing the book. And he approached Dr. Silkworth and Dr. Silkworth, whose opinion we're going to get to, not today, we're not going to get to it today. But when we do get to it, you will see that Dr. Silkworth is not only our great medical benefactor, but without the doctor's opinion, there is no program. There's, there's nothing to build on. There's nothing to establish anything on. There's no foundation. That's the word I'm looking for. Dr. Silkworth is going to give us the perfect description of what this disease is. It's a disease. What does that mean, disease? A lot of people, they struggle. They say, what do you mean I have a disease? I feel fine. I may be 50, 60 pounds overweight, but I feel fine. Disease means only that you are separated from the normal. If everybody had diabetes, then diabetes would be considered a normal condition of the pancreas. But since only a certain percentage of people have diabetes, it is considered an illness. If everybody had an ulcer or everybody had pneumonia, it wouldn't be considered an abnormal condition and it wouldn't be considered a disease. And the disease has two characteristics to it. A physical allergy, and Dr. Silkworth will teach us in his opinion that any description of this illness that leaves out this physical factor is incomplete, and it also has a twist of the mind, the mental part of the disease, which compels us to drink when we're not drinking in search of relief from the intenable pain of not eating. And they approached Dr. Silkworth about writing his opinion. And originally in the first edition of this book, the first edition had, I believe, 16 printings. And the first edition, Dr. Silkworth's opinion appeared, started on page one. And then it was kind of decided before they went out in 1955 with the second edition that the book really needs to be by alcoholics for alcoholics. And what happened then was they moved the doctor's opinion into the Roman numeral section of the book. Well, getting back to the, the book project, the book project, and we don't, we're not going to go into the whole thing now, but the book project was fraught with a lot of controversy, a lot of controversy, a lot of fighting about what was going to go in the book and what wasn't going to go in the book. And there was a lot of money problems. This program did not just spring out when Dr. Bob met Bill, it didn't spring out of their noses or their butts. It came about as the result of a lot of hard work. It came about as the result of much controversy. It came about as the result of much, much stress and strain over money and content and ideology and all kinds of things, which we won't get into as much today, but I, we will get into it as time goes on. Now, what we're going to do is look at this project and we're going to look at the very, very beginning, the title page. But just to conclude our little history lesson here, the book was started in 1937 and it was written up in 1938 and it was printed on April the 10th, 1939. April 10th, 1939 the very first edition of the first printing hit the streets and you couldn't give them away. You couldn't give them away. The reason that it was called a big book is because they had it printed rather than published. 
uh, you know, and, and Hank Parkhurst was the guy behind us keeping the rights to the book. They have since lost the rights to the first edition, unfortunately. Somebody was asleep at the switch at Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's why a lot of these other companies are printing uh, big books now where they couldn't have done that before. But anyway, not to get too far off the subject here, Hank said that if this, there was a publishing company in New York, that the name of which escapes me right now, and they wanted to give Bill a $1,500 advance on the book based on the first couple of chapters that he showed them. And Hank Parker said, if this company is willing to give us 1500 bucks, let's understand that this must be valuable. Let's not give it away. Let's keep it so that we can control it and we can own it and we can have it within AA. And that's exactly what they did. So if some other publishing company had published the book, that means that they could change it, they could alter it, they could you know, they could dilute it in any way that they saw fit. And so this would have been a very big problem. Is it odd or is it God that Hank Parkhurst insisted that we keep the rights to our own book? Thank God for Hank. Unfortunately, Hank did die drunk. He is, you know, he did uh, a lot of good things for this organization, but he did unfortunately die drunk. Okay. Let's go to the very first page of the book. I don't care what edition you are, but after it says Alcoholics Anonymous, and then you turn the page and you see, unless you have a first edition or something, you're going to see a bunch of books on your left about AA that they have. And then you're going to see the title page. You're going to see the title page of Alcoholics Anonymous. I hope you can all see that. I know it's a little hard to see sometimes because I've got the background thing going, but this is what it should look like. Okay, now in the very, very first edition, they put this in there and it was a gross exaggeration at that time. It is not a gross exaggeration at this time in life, thank God. But let's take a look at what it says. It says, Alcoholics Anonymous the story of how many thousands of men and women have recovered. There's that word recovered. What's the second most asked question on a vision for you behind, can you hear me? May I be heard? Can I be heard? That's the first most asked question. And the second one is, what's the difference between recovered and recovering? Well, here's the story of how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. And in the book I'm holding, it says fourth edition. I don't know what edition you have, but if it's a fourth edition, it will not have something that appeared in the second, third, and the second and the third editions. And what was in the second and the third editions? A circle and inside the circle is a triangle. And in the triangle, it says on the left, unity, on the right, service, and on the base of the triangle, recovery. They don't have that in there anymore because we lost the copyright to it. Somebody was asleep at the switch. In the second and the third editions, it will have a circle and a triangle that the threefold purpose is unity, service, based on recovery. Unity, service, recovery. And the circle, what is the circle symbolic of? The circle is symbolic of the never ending quest for unity, service, and recovery. And this little symbol of the triangle, it's an equilateral triangle. It's not a right triangle. It's not, it's a unilateral triangle. What does that mean? What does a unilateral triangle mean? I'm no math whiz, as you know, but a unilateral triangle means that all three of the angles in the triangle are equal. And that is deliberate to make sure that we understand that unity, service, 
and recovery and the perpetuity of the circle, the never ending quest for unity, service and recovery are permanent forever. You see so many people today, they come in and they say, I've already worked through the steps, but I'm eating. Well, if something went terribly wrong, you stopped doing it or you, didn't, you never started doing certain things. So this little symbol is extremely, extremely important. Very important. Now, what else is important because it might get past us today because it is a national institution. Alcoholics Anonymous is a national institution, but in 1939, it was anything but. And in 1939, we are at the culmination of thousands of years of the struggle with alcoholism. Yes, they had alcoholism thousands of years ago. King Solomon wrote of, of in, the book of, uh, in, in the book of Solomon, he writes of alcoholism and he thought that it was an illness, but he couldn't prove it and he had no remedy for it. Uh, in England in the 1640s, there was a Dr. Trotter and Dr. Trotter, he believed that alcoholism was an illness, but he couldn't prove it and he had no cure for it. One of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, a man who would be appointed by George Washington as the very first Surgeon General of the United States of America, his name is Benjamin, was Benjamin Rush. And if you ever come to my hometown, there's a street called Rush Street. Rush Street is named after Benjamin Rush. And Benjamin Rush in 1790 published a paper in which he believed that alcoholism was an illness, but he couldn't prove it and he had no cure for it. Now here comes this drunk, Bill Wilson, whose name is not, he doesn't put his name on there as the author. He's the primary author, but there were contributions from others, many others. He's going to write a book and he's going to say, this is the story of how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. Never before in the annals of humankind has there been relief from alcoholism. They had a bunch of snake oil salesmen. They had a bunch of shysters, crooks, cheaters, con men that would sell people on things like snake oil and God knows what you know, buffalo dung or whatever that would cure alcoholism and none of it worked. It was a waste of money because it was just garbage. It was just a con, it was just a, a scam. But here's something that works. Was there thousands of them? No, 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 no. There was about 60, but Bill was a salesman. Now I started to tell you why it's called the big book and I got sidetracked. The reason that it's called the big book is because in order to sell it, they gave it a red cover and a red dust jacket. Red catches the eye. And they used the thickest paper they could get because thick paper is cheap. Thick paper is the cheapest paper that they could get their hands on. I can see Bill Wilson all over this and they published it in a way where there was very wide margins and the book was big and it was red. And I can just see some poor old soul walking down the street in Brooklyn or walking down the street in New Jersey or, or in uh, Manhattan. And he's got this tucked under his arm, good luck remaining anonymous. The book was designed to catch your eye. The dust jacket was red, black, and yellow on the first edition. It was big and it was designed to catch your eye. So here we have the story of how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism. There was really about 60, don't kid yourself. But Bill, as I say, he was a very good salesman and he put that in there. Now, if I'm going to argue with the author of a book, I might, be, I might be arguing with, say, one person, maybe two. 
But here's a book written by thousands of these alcoholics. It's a little hard to argue with it. Actually, as I say, it was about 60, but that was still a pretty lofty number. The number was very liquid. It changed from day to day, but it was around 60 at the time in 1939 that the book was actually printed. Let's go to the page past the table of contents, go through the table of contents, and what you're going to see on page XI, I'm going to refer the fourth edition, because I think most of you have the fourth edition. I'm a very lucky guy. I'm going to tell you a story here. This is something that knocked my socks off. This is an incredible story. I got to tell this. I was on a meeting of the vision for you. And I was doing a Sunday special edition. <clears throat> and I happened to mention something. Of, oh, I did, a, I did a special edition on the history of the big book with the Rockefeller dinner and Willard Richardson and the money and the things and the this and the that and the fighting that went on. And I happened to mention, I would love before I die to possess a first printing, first edition big book. About three months later, about three months later, right around this time of year, I think, maybe a little earlier, August or September, I have a post office box. I don't get any mail at my house. Um, I get it at the post office box for lots of different reasons, but not the least of which is it's extremely secure. If you're going to steal from our mailboxes, you'll probably get away with it. I don't want to tempt you if you're a crook, but if you want to steal from our mailboxes out there, you'll probably get away with it because it's not very secure out there. And that's number one. But I like the fact that my business gets the mail at the post office box so I can get all my personal mail there too. So I go to the post office box and there's a little notice that there's a package for me. I go in and I, here's my thing. And they give me a package and it's from Dothan, Alabama. I, have, I don't know anybody that lives in Dothan, Alabama. I have no idea who's sending me this package. And I open the package. There's no note. There's no nothing. There's no indication who sent this to me. And it is wrapped like you'd wrap something extremely valuable. And the, re the only thing on the return address was the big book guy. And I think his address was in Alabama as well. And what's inside? A first edition, first printing big book in almost pristine condition. I mean, this thing is in pristine condition. The value of that book is about $50,000. That book is worth about $50,000. And um, I called this big book guy. I tracked him down on the internet. He would not tell me to this. He would not tell me who sent it to me. It was a completely anonymous thing. And it's an incredible story because I can't believe somebody would do that but I, I have no idea who this person is. So if you're on this meeting and there's 122 of you and you are that person or you know that person, thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart. About a month or two later, I get a pristine, I mean, mint copy, second edition, first printing, I mean, this thing looks like it just came off the printing press. Second edition, first printing. I mean, this was same exact scenario. Unbelievable. I guess God really inspired somebody to do something really nice because I really appreciate it. So if you're on this line or you know who sent those things to me, A, please tell me and B, thank them from the bottom of my heart. All right. Let's go to page XI, the preface. Now, the preface was not in the first edition. The preface was not in 
these things, but there is a preface now. Let's take a look at what it says. We're going to move through this rather quickly. Uh, we're going to slow down quite a bit in the forward to the first edition, but there's really no reason for us to slow down a lot during this preface. This is the fourth edition of the book Alcoholics Anonymous. The first edition appeared in April 1939, and in the following 16 years, more than 300,000 copies went into circulation. The second edition, published in 1955, reached a total, <clears throat> excuse me, reached a total of more than 1,150,500 copies. The third edition, which came off the press in 1976, achieved a circulation of approximately 19,550,000 in all formats. You can see the miracle of God. You can see God's hand all over this. Just as I keep saying, walk to God, he'll run to you. When the organization of Alcoholics Anonymous walked to God, God ran to Alcoholics Anonymous. You can see the organization in its flourishing times as it's flourishing and continuing to flourish today. And why does it flourish? Well, the message works on page 88 of this book. One of the most important sentences ever written in the history of man was written. It says, it works, it really does. <sighs> Number two, the information in here is laid out in such a simple way that anybody can follow it. You don't have to be a mechanical engineer. You don't have to be versed in God knows what. You don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be a psychologist, psychiatrist, or a physician to understand the simple method of recovery that is outlined in this book. What a miracle you hold in your hand. What a miracle you are. But what a miracle you hold in your hand when you hold in your hand the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Let's continue with the preface. Because this book has become the basic text for our society and has helped such large numbers of alcoholic men and women to recovery, there exists strong sentiment against any radical change being made in it. Don't you dare touch my big book. Now there has been some changes. The appendix two was written, appendix two, uh, came into it came into this situation as the result of the first printing of the first edition the first printing of the first edition they were getting all kinds of questions and the questions that they were getting were what we're not having this spiritual experience that you're describing what are we doing wrong so they wrote the spiritual awake appendix to a spiritual awakening spiritual experience to explain that in some cases the spiritual awakening which is slow and the spiritual experience which is fast are fine there's, there's not a problem. And then they changed step 12. And how did they change step 12? Well, they changed it by saying, instead of having had a spiritual experience in my first edition, which is, it's, in a, uh, it's in a safe deposit box. I don't keep that in the house. But somebody's unmuted. Somebody's definitely unmuted. But anyway, uh, it, having had a spiritual experience as the result of the steps was changed to having had a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps. They changed step 12. So we have a message that when worked thoroughly and completely will work. There's absolutely no reason to change it. There's no reason to alter it. I am not opposed to OA literature, I am not opposed to anything if it works for you. The problem that I have with some of it is, it is in direct conflict with some of the things that are in the big book. And that's where it can become dangerous for me. I'm not talking about what's dangerous for you. You got to do what works for you. If the OA literature works for you, if 
if whatever works for you, God bless you. I am not the judge and the jury of what should work for another person, nor am I going to pretend that I know what's best. I only know what works for me because I'm still alive. And the only reason I'm still alive, the only reason I'm still alive is to carry the message. But the only reason I have survived is because of what is in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I did not come here to find God. I did not come here to find anything. I did not come here to find a fellowship. I came here to get people off my back so they would stop nagging me about being fat and they would leave me alone and I could die in peace. That's why I came here. I came here to get people off my back. What I found was that the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous would introduce me to a book called Alcoholics Anonymous. And the Fellowship of Overeaters Anonymous was what I meant to say. The Fellowship of Overeaters Anonymous would introduce me to a book called Alcoholics Anonymous. And the book Alcoholics Anonymous would introduce me to a higher power that has never let me down, never failed me, even though I didn't act maturely. And even though my actions didn't warrant the tremendous miracles laid at my feet. I received those miracles and I continue to recover today. I did not come here to find God. I did not come here to find people. God introduced me to the people. The people introduced me to the book. The book led me to God. It's been an amazing, amazing journey. So when we read this sentence about society uh, about because this book has become the basic text of our society and has helped such large numbers of alcoholic men and women to recovery there exists strong sentiment and against any radical changes being made in it i would oppose any change to it at all yes some of the language is archaic Yes, some of the language is very male oriented, like our women folk or whatever, but let's just kind of work with it. Let's just kind of work with it because anytime you go in and you start to change something, it's not going to be good. It's just not going to be good. Let's continue. Therefore, the first portion of this volume describing the AA recovery <clears throat> program, the AA recovery program has been left largely untouched in the course of revisions made for the second, third, and fourth editions. The section called the doctor's opinion has been kept intact just as it was originally when it was originally written in 1939 by the late William D. Silkworth, our society's great medical benefactor. And once again, without Silkworth, there is no program. The book would make no sense at all whatsoever. And there wouldn't be the recoveries that you have today. So again, it took more than Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob to create the book. It took more than Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson to create the fellowship. Bill's birthday was yesterday. He would have been 126 years old. He was born November 26, 1895. And we celebrate his birthday every day. And we keep him alive. We keep him in perpetuity with our recoveries. He is a, as alive today as he ever was. His words ring true in our ears and give us relief from the intenable pain of this disease and the degradation of this disease. He is alive today and he lives through each and every one of us. Let's continue. The second printing of the first edition added the appendix, spiritual experience, in the second edition, the appendices on the AA tradition and the medical view and religious view of AA, the Lasker Award, and information on how to contact AA were added. And the appendix on the Alcoholic Foundation was discontinued. But the chief change was in the section of personal stories, which was expanded to reflect the fellowship's growth. Bill's story, Dr. Bob's nightmare, and one other personal history from the first edition were retained intact. That would be our Southern friend. 
the reason that they will never mess with our Southern friend, which appears in the fourth edition on page 208, is because it's referenced in the fourth chapter. So you can't, the story was written by Fitz Mayo. And Fitz was the guy who hid in a deserted barn, waiting to die and so on. It's referenced and he was a minister's son. His father was an Episcopal minister. He was from Maryland. He was friends with Jimmy Burwell. Fitz Mayo's story will never get altered, changed, or deleted because it's referenced in the body of the big book. So you can't futz with it. I wouldn't, I don't know why you'd want to, because Fitz's story is a, you know, he's the guy that he tumbled to his knees and said, if there's a God, show yourself. And he eventually gets sober. He eventually gets recovery. So that's a pretty big miracle. <clears throat> Three were edited and one of these was retitled. New versions of the two, of two stories were written with new titles. 30 completely new stories were added and the story section was divided into three parts under the same headings that are used now. The story that got retitled was Dr. Paul's story. It used to be called Dr. Alcoholic Addict. Now it's called Acceptance is the Answer. They retitled that story to reflect acceptance is the answer because a lot of people really love that story. And what used to be on page 449, acceptance is the answer to all my problems today, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you're not familiar with that, stick around this fellowship. You soon, you'll hear all about that. Dr. Paul, acceptance is the answer. They retitled it, acceptance is the answer, but it used to be called Dr. Alcoholic Addict. And Dr. Paul's story is a big favorite among a lot of people. It caused a lot of controversy when it came out. A lot of alcoholics say, this is Alcoholics Anonymous. We don't want to talk about your drugs. We don't want to talk about your pills and your, 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 your drug addiction to, the, to these pills and all this other crap that you're squirting in your veins and all this. We don't want to hear that. This is Alcoholics Anonymous. We want to talk about alcoholism. We don't want to talk about drugs. We don't want to talk about food. We don't want to talk about your damn gambling or you're womanizing or you're menizing or whatever the hell you're doing. But a lot of people are more open to it than they have been. And there's some controversy there too. But that's the story that got retitled. In the third edition, I'm on page XII. In the third edition, part one, Pioneers of AA was left unchanged. Nine of the stories in part two, they stopped in time, were carried over from the second edition. Eight new stories were added. In part three, they lost nearly all. Eight stories were retained. Five new ones were added. As bottoms came up, and age came down and the fellowship got younger and more female and more minorities started coming in. They were changing some of the stories to try and reflect the fact that we were we are in AA and OA, a changing society. We are a society that is on the change. Okay, fine. Now, the fourth edition includes the 12 concepts for world service and revises the three sections of personal stories as follows. One new story has been added to part one, and two that originally appeared in part three have been repositioned there. Six stories have been deleted. Uh, six of the stories in part two have been carried over, 11 new ones have been added, and 11 taken out. Part three now includes 12 new stories, eight were removed in addition to the two that were transferred to part one. All that sounds, hope. I mean, it, it really, who cares? But what it's telling us is, as the society, as the membership changes, things, they, they saw what was happening and they adapted to it as best they could. All changes made over the years in the big book, AA members fond name for this volume, have had the same purpose to represent the current membership of Alcoholics Anonymous more accurately and thereby to reach more al thereby to reach more alcoholics if you have a drinking problem we hope that you may pause in reading one of these 42 personal stories and think yes that happened to me or more important yes i have felt like that or most important yes i believe this program 
can work for me too. Why do we have the stories? The stories are there because William James wrote a book called The, the, uh, the Varieties of Religious Experience. I'm not getting any younger kids. I'm not getting any younger here. The Varieties of Religious Experience, which from about 1902, he did a series of lectures in Edinburgh, Scotland at the University of Edinburgh. He was a psychologist. And in these lectures, there were people's discovery of God because of great adversity. So the, pro the stories illustrate what these people were like, what happened to them, and what they're like now. Does that sound familiar? And through these stories, we can identify in, we can identify in, hopefully, and we can say, yes, I believe this program can work for me too. Very, very important. And the, William James's book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, is one of the pages, one of the books that we frame this book from. There were four books that were highly instrumental. One was the book of James in the New Testament. One was the Common Sense of Drinking by Richard Peabody. One was the Sermon on the Mount by um, Emmett Fox. And the other one was the Varieties of Religious Experience by William James. Those are the four books most influential on the big book of AA. Now let's go to page XIII or 13 in Roman numerals. We're not going to finish the forward to the first edition today, but we're going to give it a good start. And this is the, we may finish it. Let's just see how far we get. I doubt we'll finish it. But anyway, this is the forward as it appeared in the first edition, first printing of the first edition in 1939. We're on page X, I, I, I in the fourth edition, reading the forward to the first edition. Okay, now let's take a look at the first word of the book. Now, remember, there was no preface in 1939. The very first thing that you see in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, is the foreword to the first edition. You see the table of contents. You see the title page. But this is the first words that you're going to see other than the title page and the table of contents. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100. See, he didn't use the thousands anymore because he, he calmed down a little bit in 1939. He, knew, he, he didn't want to do that. Okay, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered, there's that word again, second most Asked question on vision, what's the difference between recovery and recovering? Seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Stop right there. We, we admitted we were powerless over food. Not I admitted or you admit that you were powerless over food. This is part and parcel to the work done by Dr. Howard, who was a psychiatrist in New Jersey. He lived in New Jersey and he told Bill that you have to write this in such a way that it is in the declarative rather than the imperative. What's, what does that mean? The declarative rather than the imperative. Imperative is like chapter seven. You do this and you do this and you say this and don't say that. That's imperative. The declarative is write it in the past tense. This is what we did. We recovered. We did this. And the first word is we. Why? Because it lets you know you're not alone. That's very, very important to an alcoholic. Ever since I could remember, all the way back in my life to ages three, four, five, six, 20, 30, whatever it might have been at that time, my ego gave me some false information. And I believed that information. Here's the information that I believed. 
I believed that the way I ate and the way I thought about food and the critical negative way that I thought about God and the world were secret unto me. That the fears, the unfounded fears that I had in my heart, the unfounded angers that I had in my heart, these I believed were secret unto me. And it made me feel alone. And it made me feel different. And it made me feel like a victim. And it filled me with self-pity and rage and fear. And I was upset all the time. And the more upset that I got, the more I ate. And the more I ate, the more upset I got. And the more I ate, the worse things got. And the worse things got, I ate more and more and more. So this word, we, alcohol, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. All I needed to know was there's other people who think like me and there's other people who react like me. That's why I need the fellowship. I need meetings. I need the book. The great emancipators are steps five and nine, because five will put me in touch with the fact that these things are not secret unto me, and nine will give me an opportunity to straighten out the past so I can walk the streets a free man, unshackled from the guilt, the shame, the fear, the anger and remorse of the horrible things that I've done with money and the people I've lied to and hurt. It gives me great comfort to know that I'm not alone. There's 120 of us, 119 people are here this morning. And I thank you all for coming. And I hope you're getting a lot out of it. But you're making me feel less alone by joining me. Wouldn't help me much to sit here and talk to a computer screen, trust me. But the fact of the matter is, the sobriety that I enjoy cannot be brought about by fellowship alone. But the fellowship is critical to me because it puts me in touch with your feelings, your fears, your trepidations, and the experiences from your life. And in doing that, you make me feel like I can survive another day. I need you and we need each other. <clears throat> I don't wanna preach. I don't wanna sound like a rabbi or a preacher or anything like that. But what I will also say, and I've said this before and I will continue to say this, we need each other very, very much. We have also failed the Native American community we have failed the black community. We have failed the Hispanic community tremendously. I have spoken many, many times in many different conventions and retreats and, and, and all kinds of places all over this country, all over this world. I've been to Jerusalem and Canada and so on. I haven't been to Europe or Asia or Africa, but I've been to Jerusalem and I've been most of the states here and, and Canada. You would get the impression that this is just a disease that affects white people. And that is not true. Certainly, we will be better when we are more diverse, more different than we are today. Don't fear that. Don't fear it. It's, 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 it's just going to help us all. Every one of us will be benefited when we are more diverse than we are today. But we all need this program. And one of the reasons I do not miss meetings, I don't miss vision unless I'm deathly ill or unless I'm just, I've had surgery or, so, or there's a, some kind of reason, maybe I'm traveling and I can't be on in the, whatever that reason is, it's very rare that that happens. I don't miss because I don't know what you're going to say that's going to help me. I listen to every share. I listen to every question. 
Very seldom do I miss a Sunday special edition too. I like the Sunday special editions, even though I am sometimes at odds with what the person is saying or they're reading it. I hate when they read it. I go nuts when they read it. Don't read it. Speak from the damn heart for God's sakes. But anyway, I can always tell when they're reading it and that's fine. Whatever it is, I'll be fine. I'll do a step 10 and I'll be fine. But the bottom line is, is that we need each other. We of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Now, I'm not even going to read the next sentence, which we're going to spend quite a bit of time on, because we're going to finish for today. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to start at the forward to the first edition again next week. We're going to review some of what we did today, but for the purpose of today, we're going to be done and we're going to start questions and answers. Uh, and we're going to do that for a while. And what I would like to do is I would like to call upon Karen from New York, Karen K, whose credits, as you know, do not transfer. Does everybody <laughs> know what that means, by the way? It's a very, it's a wonderful thing. Let me explain that if I can. Karen is very smart and she does a tremendous amount of uh, service to to OA she 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 she's a real uh she's a real go-getter when it comes to her recovery when when she says her credits don't transfer she's telling you something that works on two levels number one if you are in another program and you've worked through the steps in Al-Anon or AA or NA or GA or whatever the hell you are, what she's telling you there is that work will not transfer to OA. That's a brilliant thing. How, she, how concise she has pared that down to make that so simple to digest. The work you've done in other programs will not transfer to this program. You've got to work your steps here. You've got to do what you need to do here. The other thing she's brilliant about is she understood that the work that you did yesterday, the shower that you took yesterday, ain't going to keep you clean today. The shower that you took three years ago ain't going to keep you clean so her credits don't transfer, works on a couple of different levels, and they're all life-saving and profound. If you listen, she's got a lot of wisdom when she says that. And she says other things too that are wonderful. I'm not saying that's the only thing she says that's great, but I didn't mean, to, I didn't mean for it to come out that way. But she has, when she says, I'm Karen and my credits don't transfer. She's reminding you, you have a permanent progressive fatal disease, permanent progressive and fatal. And the work you do in other programs ain't going to keep you out of the food, sister. It's just not, or brother, it's not going to work. Anyway, enough preaching. I'm going to turn it over to Karen and uh, let's get the questions and answers till we've got 26 minutes left. The reason I'm hustling today is Oregon plays Oregon State today. And I've got one hour to get to the Pita Jungle for lunch and back. And then the game is on. So before we ask the questions, remember, no math, no food. And if you asked a question last week, stay back and let somebody who didn't ask a question last week come forward and then if they're done then you can go okay karen take it away thank you very much harlan and uh, once again another stellar job and we're going to start the q a and the recording thank you